Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. John Iskander. On behalf of uh, CDC, I'd like to welcome you to Public Health Grand Rounds. Continuing education credits for Public Health Grand Rounds are available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, health educators, and other health professionals. Uh, please see more at the Grand Rounds website. Uh, Grand Rounds is available on all of your favorite web and social media sites. Uh, for today's special session, uh, we will only be taking questions by email and social media, uh, and we're also live tweeting today. Um, here's a preview of upcoming Grand Round sessions. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. Uh, I'd like to thank today's featured speakers uh, and the many people listed here who helped to make this session possible. We have a featured video segment on uh, YouTube and our website called Beyond the Data, which is posted shortly after the session. Uh, this month's segment features my interview with Dr. Jordan Tapero. We've also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles relevant to this session. Uh, the full listing is at cdc.gov slash science clips. It's now my pleasure to introduce the CDC director, Dr. Tom Frieden. Thank you all very much for being here, uh, and thanks to the speakers and those who contributed to the talks that we'll hear. Uh, Ebola was an unprecedented epidemic with an unprecedented response. We've not yet gotten to zero, although we're tantalizingly close, but we're optimistic that we will. The progress has been enormous, and it's been the result of enormous activity and effort on really all parts of CDC and a large number of our national and international partners and the countries and communities in West Africa. We still have 150 people in West Africa in the three affected countries, and we still need people to go. So if you're willing, Barb Marston is right in the front of the room. Uh, and we'll also take emails with uh, volunteers. I think there are really three key lessons from Ebola. The first is that every single country needs strong capacity to find, stop, and prevent health threats when they emerge. That's what global health security agenda is all about. And this is a golden opportunity for the world, including CDC, to accelerate progress in laboratory systems, epidemiologic systems, surveillance systems, emergency response, vaccination, and other programs in the countries around the world that need it most and have it least. The second key lesson, I believe, is that when country capacities are overwhelmed, the world needs to be able to surge in more rapidly to support progress. That means that at CDC, we've created the GRIT, the Global Rapid Response Team, able to put 50 people virtually anywhere in the world within just a couple of days. We're working to support and strengthen the World Health Organization, uh, the African Union CDC, uh, and other organizations so that the world can move rapidly when something is too much for an individual country. And the third is the enormous importance of infection control. Healthcare workers are on the front lines. They're potentially at risk. They are also critically important in reporting diseases and outbreaks. And healthcare facilities can be both amplifiers of disease and controllers of outbreaks. And we need to make sure that they're safe for healthcare workers, safe for patients, good information sources for public health and part of the solution in terms of stopping outbreaks. Now, um, as we move forward, we have a unique opportunity to make sure that we don't go back to the world that existed before Ebola, a world in which there was no accountability for whether countries were ready on the one hand and inadequate assistance from the world to support countries to become ready on the other. Ebola provides us with really a unique opportunity to improve preparedness in countries around the world 
and it's up to us to seize that opportunity and make sure we make as much progress as rapidly as possible. So I'm very much looking forward to the presentations and thank the speakers for being here. Thank you very much, Dr. Frieden. Uh, our next speaker is Jennifer Nuzzo. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here to talk about what was clearly one of the most pressing health security challenges um, I've seen in really a very long time. Um, the Ebola crisis that started in West Africa has sickened more than 28,000 people. It's caused upwards of 11,000 11, deaths. It's been devastating to the economies that have been affected. And President Obama and Director Frieden both rightly described it as a threat to our national security. And I completely agree. The challenges that have arisen during this crisis um, really are enormous. But we can and we should learn from them so that we understand how we can respond better in the future and hopefully prevent such a crisis from happening again. And that's what I want to talk about today, some of these lessons. So before I get into the challenges, I want to talk a little bit about what I think worked well, because there have been a lot of bad news stories that have dominated, and I want to rightly sort of celebrate um, responses that went well. First, there is absolutely no doubt that the Ebola crisis would have been much, much worse if it weren't for the um, health care and public health professionals who are on the front lines tackling this crisis. The bravery, sacrifice, and impact of these individuals um, is really enormous, and they were rightly recognized as Time uh, Magazine's Person of the Year. And I consider that to be an enormous success. I'm also incredibly proud of U.S. leadership during this crisis. Um, this graph here shows some of the U.S. commitments. It doesn't even include the $5.4 billion Ebola supplemental that Congress passed. Quite enormous, especially compared to other countries. And it's not just the U.S. government. It's also the NGOs that are within the country, volunteers who went over, potentially putting their lives at risk. I know that CDC staff played a pivotal role in all of this, and really, you deserve our nation's thanks for all of your hard work and your efforts. And I know that the work continues, and we should continue to offer thanks on that front. It's not just me who thinks that this is important. Um, the American public really does, too. And it's really hard to tell in the media reports. But if you look at this polling data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, the majority of Americans think that working overseas um, you know, to, to make investments in developing countries helps protect Americans here. Like, it helps to prevent by spreading um, help the spread of diseases like Ebola. Um, seven in 10 Americans say that this is important to do. And nearly six in 10 think that this is important to do, not just for our own public health, but also to protect, to enhance the US image abroad. There's also good support for um, what we've done at home to tackle Ebola in cases that have um, arisen in the US. Um, this survey shows that there's, high, there's a high level of confidence in both in CDC, public health agencies, and local hospitals um, to be able to respond. You know, if respondents were asked, you know, if di Ebola was uh, diagnosed in your area, how confident are you that CDC, the hospitals, and health departments would be able to respond? And there's, as you can see, fairly high levels of confidence. There was a dip in confidence, for sure, after the um, Texas Ebola death. But if you look at the numbers, they're still pretty high and certainly well above that, which you typically see for you know, members of Congress, which I know, don't set the bar too high, but. I think another key success is um, the rapid expansion of diagnostic capabilities within the region. You know, it's important to remember that you know, although we think that the first Ebola cases probably happened sometime in maybe December 2013, the first um, case that was confirmed was confirmed in March 2014 when a specimen was sent to France for laboratory testing. Now, clearly, once the case is accelerated after March, that wasn't going to be sustainable to be able to have to send um, specimens out. And so um, there was uh, much effort in uh, enhancing the diagnostic capabilities locally. And I know CDC staff were particularly involved in helping set up these laboratory networks that emerged w really within a matter of months. And that's a great success as well. 
It's also success, you know, given this, well, this wasn't the first time you know, the U.S. government thought about Ebola, and thanks to some advanced investments on behalf of the U.S. government, um, rapid response from the private sector, and flexible regulatory mechanisms like emergency use or authorization, we also saw the development of additional diagnostic tools for Ebola. So as of August 2014, or since August 2014, um, 10 diagnostic tools have now um, been developed that can be potentially used um, under emergency conditions. So that is by far not a comprehensive list of all the successes. I just wanted to really kind of highlight what I think um, was particularly helpful. But I really do want to turn um, attention now to what are some of the challenges um, that we not only experience during Ebola, but what we're likely to experience, um, you know, moving forward for future health security threats. There have been a lot of after action reports, look backs, you know, um, exposés of all the things that went wrong. And I don't, I'm not going to try to give a comprehensive list of everything that I think um, didn't work. But I, what I do want to focus on is what I think are the key issues that we need to address going forward. Because without addressing these issues, we're going to have similarly difficult problems in future health security threats. So one of the problems is on surveillance. Now, when the world awoke to the crisis that was unfolding in West Africa, there were a lot of people, including esteemed public health folks, who uh, you know, caused, called this crisis a surprise. Um, you know, they explained that previous outbreaks were never nearly as many people involved, they were typically in rural areas, they were quickly contained, and the, the situation in West Africa was really unprecedented. But I guess we have to examine whether or not it really should have been a surprise. Um, this map here um, shows the host range of bats that have been known to harbor um, a year Ebola virus. So when you ask the question, you know, was um, Ebola in West Africa a surprise, the answer from the animal health community perspective is no. This is something that I want to talk about a little bit because this, in, those of us who work in preparedness, this is like our, this is the challenge. It's, it's defeating the mentality of it hasn't happened, therefore it isn't going to happen. Um, and we have to figure out how to get around that. I think it's something that the, the bipartisan 9-11 commission called a failure of imagination. We have to better anticipate what threats are going to be. But early detection is hard and I don't think it should be our sole focus. What I think is also probably perhaps an even greater priority is making sure that when we do recognize there's a crisis, that we have the right information at our hands to be able to respond effectively. Clearly what happened in Texas was a shortcoming of surveillance. Um, it took days and multiple visits to a hospital for that patient to be diagnosed with Ebola. Um, we now know there are various reasons for why that is, but we need to fix that to make sure that doesn't happen again. There's also problems on the governance, global governance front. You know, after SARS in 2003, a lot of effort was put into trying to fix some of the problems that we saw um, with global governance. And a lot of effort was put onto updating the international health regulations and rolling them out, entering them into force. Um, and, and there is enormous potential in the revised international health regulations. But unfortunately, what we saw in Ebola is that they don't completely solve the problem. In fact, I don't think anybody thinks that it's a good thing that Ebola wasn't de declared a public health um, event of international concern until August, when there were already four countries reporting cases, um, you know, um, over 1,700 cases and 1,000 deaths, which was four times as many cases as we had seen in any prior Ebola outbreak. So we need to figure out better mechanisms for how we motivate global action in responding to crises. I think if you looked at the earlier slide of U.S. Um, contributions to the Ebola crisis, I mean, there was an enormous, I mean, really unprecedented levels of um, commitment to responding. And we did a lot of really important things on the ground. But one thing that we didn't do was that organizations who were on the front lines kept asking for, which was sending teams of clinicians who could treat sick Ebola patients. This was something that was absolutely necessary, not just because, of course, we want to protect people, you know, take care of people who are sick, but because we found that it's very hard to get populations to accept our public health messages if we can't give them some assurances that we're going to take care of their loved ones if they get sick. 
And it's also important that we have effective medical response to these inf acute infectious disease emergencies because as Director Frieden said, healthcare facilities can become ultimately sources of infection for the rest of the community if we don't figure out how we care for the sick and protect the well within those facilities as well. Politics was another problem, it's always a problem. Um, I'm gonna show you an excerpt from an after action report. This excerpt, um, just some of the themes that emerge here, are tensions between federal and state um, authorities, disagreements over what level of action, whether or not we should close borders, implement quarantines. It sounds very familiar, right? It sounds like the story of Ebola. It's actually an, an excerpt from a uh, tabletop exercise that our center conducted in 2001 called Dark Winter. Um, it was a fictional smallpox uh, response exercise. Based on dark winter, and really every other um, you know, emerging infectious disease emergency we've seen since 2001, it should have been completely, I mean, it was, you could tell that within short order, public health officials were going to have to suddenly divert their attention from responding to the crisis to trying to manage the political fallout from leaders trying to do things like shut down borders, cancel travel, all things that our best evidence say we're likely not going to work and would ultimately just exacerbate the toll of the crisis. This is a state response, a state Ebola response plan. You can see that the public health officials that drafted this plan were clearly aware of this problem. They talked about the consequences of, um, you know, um, quarantining asymptomatic individuals and that there's no scientific rationale for this. Um, Unfortunately, this plan was ultimately scrapped by the political leaders in that state um, who basically decided to implement um, policies that were not, let's just say, not consistent with CDC guidance. Um, and this is really unfortunate. One thing I think that's particularly difficult, and I want to point it out in this slide, you can see in the quotes there's this term, ab abundance of caution. We have to put this term to bed. We cannot use this, because what this term really means is based on no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> and it's dangerous, because when we say out of abundance of caution, it gives the perception that there is evidence somewhere, and it basically reinforces people's fears that they are going to get sick. And it's dangerous, because it creates an inconsistency in our message. You know, we can't say there is no threat, there's very little threat from asymptomatic individuals, and then say, but out of an abundance of caution, we are going to scrub down every single place that this individual went before they became sick. I know that when the, um, the doctor got sick in, in New York, I got lots of calls from the media asking, well, if they say that he didn't, likely didn't infect people before he became sick, why are they scrubbing the bowling alley? Why are they closing down the meatball shop? Um, What's underlining those questions that, that the media was asking is, are they lying to us? And that's a really bad place for public health to be. So we have to be very aware of the consistency of our message. And, and these weren't like crazy out there media outlets asking these questions. In fact, many of them came from NPR. So, you know, which you consider to be generally balanced on the issues. So moving forward. You know, how do we go move beyond these challenges? Um, does everybody know who this is? Okay, good. I'll just leave it there. So we have to fix surveillance. Um, this picture shows some of the changes that were made to the electronic health um, record of the hospital that experienced the Ebola case in Dallas. Essentially what it did was try to routinize some of the questions that frontline clinicians should be asking, like travel history. Um, I think that these approaches are really important, and I think we should continue to support them and make sure um, they exist elsewhere, because I know that I've talked to folks in public health departments that they express frustrations when they get questions from their hospitals, like, when can we stop asking how travel history? In this day and age, you can't. And so we have to put some of this, into, we have to try to create a culture around this, possibly routinizing it, and maybe in some of the uh, data systems. The other thing that we absolutely need to figure out is how we are going to medically manage patients in acute infectious disease emergencies. MSF, WHO, and Bill Gates have all pointed to the absence of a clinical response as one of the greatest challenges that they face during Ebola. And I 
completely agree, and I think we have to figure out how to do this. We, when the U.S., I mean, if, if we are serious about this being a national security crisis, and I completely agree that it is, think about <laughs> what that means. I mean, we don't go to war by just issuing a general call to volunteers and see who shows up, right? We <laughs> recruit individuals. We make sure we have appropriate skill sets. We train them for the mission. We make sure that they um, know what the mission is, and we give them all the protection that we can to make sure they come back safely. And we pay them for their job. And at the very least, we make sure that they're not fired when they return to their day jobs. But when we're thinking about medical response, we also, I think, have to examine um, the generalizability and scalability. Now, I think the tiered response for US hospitals for Ebola that's been developed um, is important work, and I think it makes sense in the context of the current Ebola crisis. But we also need to think about whether or not we can apply this model to other infectious disease threats. And I think the answer may be no, <laughs> because if you consider um, what we're doing with these tiered hospitals, I mean, the, the total capacity is probably very low, and particularly we know that the medical management of Ebola requires very intense commitment of staff which were there to be many more cases would be difficult for hospitals to, to maintain for a long time. Unfortunately, for the political leadership, there is this tendency to want to, you know, check the box. We've solved all problems. And, and I know folks in public health departments who are getting questions like, well, what's the MERS hospital? And so we have to examine whether or not this is a model that we want to roll out for all infectious disease threats. The next thing that we have to do is really work on promoting evidence-based policies. That means thinking in advance of the next crisis what measures we're going to take and what evidence supports them, and socializing these plans, not just with political leadership, but also with the public. Now, this is something that is coming from the think tank world. We take very seriously, and we do, and we were really horrified by the political um, debates over um, travel restrictions during Ebola, and we tried to do our parts by talking to the media and briefing uh, policymakers and writing pieces to try to counteract those, um, I would call, reflexes. Um, but we, we can't just you know, focus on political leadership. We also have to reach members of the public and figure out whether or not the plans that we have for them are consistent with what they would expect and be willing to do in an emergency. Um, and a good example of this is some colleagues of mine have been working with the uh, state of Maryland to do some focus groups around allocation of um, scarce resources in a pandemic. Basically asking, posing questions to the public, you know, if there wasn't enough to go around, who should we allocate the care to? You know, who, who, whose lives should we um, preferentially try to save? Um, and apparently the, the results of those focus groups have been completely eye-opening and have been very useful for, for state planning efforts. We need to do more things like that to make sure we are appropriately capturing the values of the public in our response plans. The goal here is that when we actually roll out the plans, it's done so in partnership with the public, the political leadership, and public health. This is um, something that had to happen after, um, this is in New York City, the leadership there had to go eat meatballs as a show of confidence that um, the general public was not put at risk. One thing that I'm really worried about when we're talking about public health plans is what the political le legacy of some of the, the measures that we had to take during Ebola. And what I'm quite worried about is the monitoring of travelers from West Africa. I understand why we did this. Politically, it was far preferable than um, restricting travel to and from those areas. But what we're already seeing is um, I worry that we've created expectations in the political leadership that this is something that we can and should do in future um, crises that originate abroad. So we need to examine whether or not this is something that we want to roll out. And if not, we ne may need to reset political expectations around this. Um, as Director Frieden said, I think we have enormous uh, opportunity in front of us um, to, you know, build on some of the lessons of Ebola, and particularly using the global health security agenda as a mechanism to do so. Um, I've heard a lot of criticisms of the GHSA from people, or skepticism, thinking, well, this is too, you know, too American, it's too Western-centric, you know, developing countries that have high levels of infectious disease burdens, they don't really care about health security. Um, I, I think Ebola kind of proved the fallacy of that thinking, but also, if we're gonna do health security right, we are going to do it by building 
core public health capacities. And so, and I say this because during Ebola, I got a call from the New York Times asking, this thing that they're doing in Texas, contact tracing, is this something that public health can do? <laughs> and you know, I said yes, and I was able to um, connect them to my colleagues in TB control who told them a lot about contact tracing. Um, lots of health security lessons exist in the public health battles that have come before Ebola, HIV, of course, TB, um, even H1N1 has lessons, so we should be building on those and making sure we build capacities that can um, function across the spectrum of um, threats. And just as an example, I tried to kind of crosswork TB control with global health security agenda. You could probably circle all of the action packages under the GHSA as being relevant to TB control, but at the very least those. Um, so, you know, what I have to say is that if, if you don't think that the global health security agenda is right for you, call it whatever you want. If you want to strengthen your capacity in the name of TB control, that's fine. We just have to do something because we can't have another um, Ebola crisis like we saw. And clearly, it showed us that in many places, including here, there's a long way to go. So thank you. With that, I'll end with a request. Um, our journal, we, our center publishes journal Health Security, and we are um, going to be publishing a special issue on surveillance and health security. I'm the editor of that. And I'd love to hear from anyone who's listening to this in terms of what you're learning um, about surveillance. So please consider submitting a manuscript. And thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Captain David Blaze. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you also for uh, uh, inviting me to be part of this really important panel. Um, John uh, asked me to talk about uh, surveillance, um, disease surveillance, and, and how it relates to global health security. Um, unfortunately, I still think um, that this is largely aspirational in nature in many parts of the globe. Uh, Jennifer already mentioned that uh, we had trouble in our own country uh, doing uh, great surveillance for this for this. Uh, but you can imagine the situation in many parts of the world. So my standard uh, disclaimers. Unfortunately, don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, okay, so surveillance. Uh, I think we all agree that surveillance is, is really a key component of, of global health security. Um, uh, I, th I do think, though, that, that surveillance doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum at all. So it, it really exists across this, this spectrum of, of science, if you will. And um, uh, I think historically, the Department of Defense has, has mainly done laboratory-based research, uh, as well as uh, clinical trial development um, of vaccines and other products um, for, for forced health protection reasons. Uh, so surveillance is, is somewhat new to our portfolio. Um, this really changed uh, two decades ago when uh, President Clinton issued uh, this Presidential Decision Directive, NSTC-7. And uh, what this did is it, it put in motion the creation of several entities, uh, one of which was the Global Emerging Infection Surveillance System, uh, GAIS. Um, and so this, this organization was tasked with strengthening uh, global disease reduction efforts, uh, disease surveillance, uh, really trying to address any emerging infectious disease that may occur. Um, the GAIS program, as, as many of you uh, have probably heard already, uh, is, is now almost two decades old, uh, and you can see that uh, it's one of DOD's responses. The scope and mandate has really only increased, I think, since, uh, since those two decades ago when, when President Clinton um, issued this directive. Uh, I think now it includes many other uh, DOD programs, uh, such as DITRA, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and other, other organizations who, do, uh, who are involved in disease surveillance and, and mitigation. Um, if, if you look at the diseases that are listed here, respiratory infections, enteric infections, febrile and vector-borne infections, uh, sexually transmitted infections, and antimicrobial resistance, uh, they really have a staying power. So these were identified 20 years ago as important, and, and they remain important today. So, so that uh, really has remained uh, largely unchanged in, uh, in, our, in our efforts. I think, like any government agency, we need policy to uh, to provide us guidance on what we do, and and uh, and certainly the DoD, we, we have a lot of policy, 
and uh, this is just some of it. I wouldn't ask you to, to read all of this by any means, but, but actually some of it applies uh, to HHS and others. And um, uh, so it, we in DOD, mostly uh, in disease surveillance and, and things related to health, uh, mostly play a collaborative role and, and are very much supportive of uh, HHS's and others' missions, uh, depending on whether it's uh, domestic or abroad. I think um, we've been directed to do uh, disease surveillance uh, in support of global health security. Um, but it's obviously, we, it's obviously we can't do surveillance everywhere. And so where do we focus our efforts is a, is a really big question. And I really like this graph. It's pretty old, uh, you know, more than a decade old from an IOM report. Um, but I think it's really at places um, uh, where many of these factors uh, converge that we should be focusing our efforts. I think the highest yield for diseases like Nipah virus and SARS and MERS uh, and Ebola are going to be where microbes change, where we interact with microbes uh, in a concentrated fashion, where there's environmental degradation and poverty. And so, so where that sweet spot is, is tough to find, and in many places it exists in developing settings where it's difficult to go. But increasingly, we should really focus our efforts uh, in, those, in those hot zones or sweet spots. Um, I think increasingly we're going to be branching out from that one hot zone or sweet spot where all these factors converge uh, to more along the parallel lines that are, that are drawn here between factors. And uh, as we increase our surveillance uh, portfolio around the world as, uh, as a global health community, I think we can get to, uh, to, to more of these areas. Switching a little bit to, um, to the DOD now uh, in a little more detail, uh, the DOD's tropical disease uh, research labs uh, have provided an ideal platform um, for, from which we can, we can conduct surveillance. Again, these labs have existed for decades, as you can see here. Uh, the lab in Cairo was, was created uh, uh, more than 50 years ago. I see several people here in the, in the audience who've, who were stationed there, who've worked there. And uh, so the tradition goes back a long way in many of these labs. Um, they're obviously located in some of these hot zones that, that I've already talked about. Uh, and that's not by mistake. It's they're there to do research on, um, on tropical disease that, that affect militaries as they, as they are stationed around the world. And they exist in places where those diseases exist. So, uh, so they are strategically positioned. And I, I think uh, it makes sense to build uh, surveillance capacity uh, around them. Um, they've really been known for, uh, for more science throughout the years, though. Uh, so they've been involved in mal many malaria diagnostics, uh, vaccines, uh, both development and testing, and even the development of oral rehydration solution. I'll focus a little bit on, on NAMRU-3, which is the lab in, in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, obviously this lab is, is the oldest one in our network um, and uh, was, was formed in the, in the 40s. Uh, and originally was, res uh, was responsible for re responding to a typhus outbreak. Uh, but you can see that, that their footprint um, and where they work is, is larger than just in Egypt. So they work in the Middle East, uh, in, uh, in Southern Europe, and in the Caucasus, and increasingly in West Africa. There's um, uh, a detachment of NAMR3 that exists in Ghana uh, and is increasingly uh, working in, in the neighboring countries there, uh, both on science and, and disease surveillance. You can see the, the, the types of projects that they work on are, are pretty broad uh, and, can, and are consistent with uh, the, the GEIS mission uh, of those diseases. Each of these labs uh, obviously has a chain of command. And in the center, the only solid lines there are from our Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. So that's our, our headquarters of, of Navy Medicine, if you will. Uh, Naval Medical Research Center is, is the parent command. Uh, of our overseas laboratories. Uh, so each of those fall under, um, uh, each of those laboratories like NAMRU-3 uh, fall under NMRC. Um, and, and they obviously have a mission that's related to force health protection, so developing a malaria vaccine, for instance. Um, obviously, global health and disease surveillance uh, are done in collaboration with many people. Uh, this is certainly not done in isolation, and, and we're not doing it alone uh, by any means. Uh, obviously, the, the most important uh, collaborator is the host country. And uh, uh, if we don't have uh, their participation, uh, disease surveillance really doesn't happen. 
Um, but on a global stage, really, uh, there's close collaborations with, with the regional WHO offices uh, and, and often with the CDC uh, uh, overseas assignees um, or, or where they're co-located co with uh, GDD sites. I think um, disease surveillance is obviously a continuous process and one um, that involves detection, interpretation, uh, response, and prevention. It's, uh, it's certainly not a one-time event, and, uh, and if we have to prepare for this continuous process. I took as an example, um, because we were talking about Ebola, um, uh, the area where Ebola would fall under in terms of our uh, surveillance paradigms. And so it would fall under febrile and vector-borne infections. And you can see the, the goal here is, is to study any infection that is related to this. It's pretty broad. Uh, obviously, it would include things like dengue, uh, malaria, uh, rickettsial disease, and Ebola. So um, we, what we try to do is support surveillance systems uh, that would detect not only human disease, um, but related diseases um, in animals, uh, in vectors, as well as environmental factors that, that may uh, contribute to this. So we really do try to, to uh, respect the epidemiologic triad and, and, and perform holistic uh, surveillance. So not just, not just looking in at, at humans where uh, the end result may be disease, but trying to understand where, uh, where those diseases come from and how we might intervene uh, before it gets to humans. Obviously, we need robust and accurate uh, diagnostics and, and correct interpretation uh, of results. Uh, so it's, it's really not just uh, uh, finding a cluster of cases. Um, that's, that's almost the easy part, uh, but making sure you have the right diagnostics in place uh, and the ability to interpret those diagnostics uh, is really important. Um, this can be extremely challenging in, in developing settings, as, as many of you who have worked overseas understand. Uh, especially when you're dealing with a, a dangerous pathogen such as Ebola. I think we've all heard of, of uh, laboratory-acquired and hospital-acquired infections, and, and certainly doing surveillance is not an easy task in these settings. Um, kind of along those lines, uh, in terms of uh, a diagnosis, um, I'll mention a, a few of our efforts uh, that the Navy conducted um, uh, in collaboration with, with many others uh, uh, during Operation United Assistance, uh, as we've termed it. Um, so the, the Navy Medical Research Center uh, laboratory actually was deployed for about nine months and, and, and did m many of the initial testings of, uh, of Ebola patients there. So they had two units that were set up at the Island Clinic in Monrovia and also a, a, a university in Ballin County. And you can see the dates here, but, but it's really important that, that uh, these labs uh, were able to provide support um, on a pretty rapid basis. They were able to, to deploy uh, within a couple weeks and, uh, and provide uh, excellent diagnostic support, as well as ongoing training for, uh, for laboratories that have replaced them. Um, I, uh, I got these, these, uh, these numbers from, um, uh, from Commander Billy Pimentel, who worked very closely with the CDC. Uh, in, in helping to develop these uh, diagnostics. Um, I think the, he mentioned to me that the initial diagnostics were actually prepared back in 2002, and so they were uh, you know, quickly uh, reignited and, and, uh, and shared with CDC, and obviously the PCR was, is, was an important contribution uh, that we worked with you all on, but, but also the development of the lateral flow assays that, that should make uh, diagnosis more, uh, more more rapid and, and, uh, and facile in developing settings. And I know there are a number of different uh, platforms that are being tested at this stage, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to one uh, pretty soon that, that can be deployed uh, in a rapid fashion over, overseas. So again, um, I'm not gonna spend much time on the response part of this. I think uh, Dr. Nuzo and I, I know Dr. Tapero are gonna, are gonna describe more about the Ebola response effort um, uh, that, that we all have heard about. Um, but I, I will say that the DOD responded mainly um, with diagnostics, uh, with logistics, and with training. And uh, it was interesting to, to talk to Dr. Tapro earlier today uh, in that um, he really felt that the uh, DOD contribution kind of stimulated a lot of interest and um, uh, reassurance uh, for other partners who, who uh, at that point got engaged in, in the whole response. So we didn't have uh, any direct patient care. Um, but did provide a lot of logistics and training. 
kind of along those the same lines of, of that continuous spectrum of surveillance, obviously prevention is key and, uh, when we're dealing with public health. And so uh, I would like to finish by highlighting some of the efforts uh, that, that our partners in, in the Army are working on. Uh, Colonel Stephen Thomas provided uh, this slide to me. And uh, um, obviously, if we can prevent um, disease, then, then we may not have to, uh, have to respond as much to it. Um, obviously, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research um, worked uh, very hard on, on, uh, on testing a, uh, one of the first Ebola vaccines. Uh, it was published uh, in April of 2015 in the New England Journal. Um, they have ongoing projects uh, in Uganda, uh, as well as in Nigeria, to test uh, further vaccines. So phase two and phase three studies are planned. And uh, the great thing there is leveraging um, some of the assets that the DOD has invested in over time. So uh, the HIV vaccine effort that, uh, that Nelson Michael uh, and others run at, at um, uh, the military HIV research uh, program uh, has, uh, has invested many, many years in sites in Uganda as well as in Nigeria. And they're, they're being leveraged to, t to uh, test some of these newer vaccines. And finally, let's, let's look to the future. I think um, where we hope, hopefully we can uh, rely on existing uh, technologies uh, that are out there to optimize uh, disease surveillance in, in, uh, in developing settings. Uh, initially, uh, DARPA uh, and then GEIS, and now hopefully others um, are supporting this. This was a, a project that the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab uh, worked on. Um, many of you know about their Essence work, and th this was essentially based on the Essence platform um, and is an open source uh, uh, surveillance system uh, that collects data through cell phones or other media. Um, the key here is, um, is, is really that the data can be collated on a near real-time basis. And in this country, in, in Asia, uh, it's not really unexpected that there's going to be uh, a peak of dengue during the rainy season. Um, but what is nice and really where, where the value of this is, is that those reports can be geo-referenced. Uh, based on your cell phone signature. And this has obvious benefits to public health providers who work in resource limited settings uh, like many of the places we all know. And so hopefully hopefully this type of technology, uh, while in its infancy now, uh, can really be spread uh, to, to many parts of, of the world uh, so that we can achieve global health security. And then my final slide uh, is, um, is, is interesting. So this is a public health network uh, in Peru. And uh, I was stationed there for four years. And this was a, a Peruvian journal article that just described a, a public health research network. And um, the orange uh, dots are actually Peruvian organizations. Um, the green are, um, uh, are foreign uh, uh, research or, or public health uh, um, institutions and the connections obviously uh, are projects or papers and um, uh, one of the things I'll point out is that the the, the Navy lab uh, is is noted there in orange uh, we were very proud of this we didn't write this article although we, we probably should have um, but but they, um, they, they 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 called us a Peruvian organization and this is really the goal um, I think of disease surveillance and, and capacity building and global health security uh, is that each country really needs to develop this capacity. Now, we are obviously supporting disease surveillance in these countries and, and science, um, but this makes sense from, from many different standpoints. So the, uh, the NAMRU organizations, they're more than 90% Peruvian, so scientists, technicians, epidemiologists, veterinarians. And so it really should be uh, a, uh, an orange dot on the map. And so I, I think building capacity like this, where it's meaningful and, and, and sustained over time, I think really has the best chance of success. And uh, obviously disease surveillance is just one component of, of uh, global health security, but, but I think if we do it right, we can, we can build these networks that, that, uh, that will make our world a, a safer place. So thank you for your time. Our, our next speaker is Captain Jordan Tapero. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we're a little bit behind schedule, so hang on to your seats. I'm going to be talking to you about the origins of the global health security agenda and the impact of the West African Ebola epidemic has had on moving it forward. 
New viral and bacterial pathogens will continue to emerge. Today's world of increasing interconnectivity and mobility accelerates this shared global risk. Global transportation and commercial air travel links emerging markets to the rest of the world more seamlessly than ever. The next epidemic may very well be just a plane ride away. As early as the 14th century, people used quarantine to keep diseases like the plague from spreading across borders. In more recent times, there have been a series of agreements between countries to address potential spread of disease, beginning with the International Sanitary Convention and later the International Health Regulations, or IHR, in 1969. Because of the many ways in which we are connected, no country can protect itself by itself. The lesson became increasingly clear during the severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, outbreak in 2003, an outbreak that spread to 37 countries across three continents in just four months. To address the shortcomings of the global response to SARS, WHO revised the international health regulations in 2005 to better control public health threats while avoiding unnecessary interference with international travel and trade. As the World Health Assembly in 2005, all 195 member states committed to achieving the goals of the revised international health regulations over the next five years. Now, the IHR required that all countries have the ability to ensure that their surveillance systems and laboratories can detect potential threats, work together with other countries to make decisions in public health emergencies, report transparently through participation in a network of national focal points, and respond to public health events. WHO House has the authority and the responsibility to declare the highest level of health threats called public health emergencies of international concerns. We have seen over time that global health risks have increased through the emergence of new organisms, drug resistance, and intentional events. HIV uh, raged undetected for over a decade before its discovery. Drug-resistant organisms are a growing public health threat. Targeted mailing of anthrax spores drew the world's attention to the reality of intentional release of dangerous pathogens. And the recent emergence of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS, and the Ebola in West Africa have kept the world on high alert. The IHR covers all events that might potentially become a public health emergency of international concern. Since 2005, WHO has declared three of these emergencies. The H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009, the reemergence of wild polio virus in 2014, and the West African Ebola epidemic. The five-year clock for IHR compliance started in 2007, but by 2012, the deadline, fewer than one in five countries had attained IHR compliance by self-report. A two-year extension to 2014 increased the number of fully compliant countries by only an additional 10%. So why, are we, so why should we care about the global health security agenda? As we've seen, most of the world is not prepared to address public health emergencies, which increase the likelihood that infectious disease threats will spread within countries and across borders. The human and economic costs of epidemics are dear. AIDS has killed over 40 million, and another 40 million people are living with HIV and in need of life-saving antiretroviral treatment. SARS killed nearly 800 people and cost an estimated 40 billion. And Ebola, Ebola has, clear, <clears throat> has killed over 11,000, people and the final costs have yet to be tallied. The 2009 H1N1 pandemic showed us that the world is not prepared for a global response. President Obama, during the September 2011 speech at the United Nations General Assembly, said, we must come together pr to prevent, detect, and fight every kind of biological danger, whether it is a pandemic, H1N1, a terrorist threat, or a treatable disease. The truth is, we need practical steps that we can take to assist all countries to reach the IHR goals, which brings us to the global health security agenda, a unifying framework to improve our global response to infectious disease threats. On February 13, 2014, leaders from 28 ministries of health, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, and the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, came together to launch this unifying framework called the global health security agenda. The vision of the agenda is to realize a world safe and secure from global health threats posed by infectious diseases. Now, at the time of the launch, Ebola was spreading undetected from Guinea to neighboring Liberia and Sierra Leone. By the fall of 2014, Ebola had galvanized the international community around the agenda. At the first Global Health Security Agenda Ministerial in September, which convened in Washington and was attended by President Obama, 44 countries joined the agenda 
Nine months later, the seven nations of the world's largest economies, the G7, pledged to help up to 60 countries achieve these global health security agenda targets. I just returned from Seoul, the second global health security ministerial meeting, which was held in Seoul, Korea. In Seoul, 51 countries made firm commitments to implement the agenda. At the close of the meeting, country leaders signed the Seoul Declaration, reaffirming their commitment to it and acknowledging that global health security should be understood as a shared, multi-sectoral responsibility that no single country can achieve alone. The global health security agenda goes further than any prior global coordination around multiple diseases and conditions. GHSA is not another single disease initiative. It drives a set of concrete and achievable actions to actualize the international health regulations. And it helps us reach public health goals through a prevent, detect, and respond model. There are 11 measurable targets, also known as action packages, that comprise the backbone of global health security agenda. While they may seem like discrete activities, they are overlapping and interrelated. Time does not allow me to walk through each and every target, but all work together to build a resilient public health system. For example, these targets include a nationwide laboratory network with a specimen referral system reaching at least 80% of its population and with effective modern diagnostics in place to detect epidemic-prone infections. It also includes a timely electronic-based biosurveillance system meeting WHO and the Animal Health Organization reporting requirements. Also, a dedicated workforce of medical and public health professionals, including at least one trained epidemiologist per 200,000 population, and a public health emergency operations center, or EOC, able to coordinate an effective and emergency response within 120 minutes for activation. To meet the objectives of these targets, we will have to combine efforts across sectors. For instance, reportable disease surveillance systems backed by competent national reference laboratories are instrumental in monitoring and reducing the risk of antimicrobial resistance and the spillover of zoonotic diseases. It's all cross-cutting. When aligned with the international health regulations, most of the ideas behind the global health security agenda are complementary. Global health security agenda builds on the agreements and the commitments countries have already made. The agenda was developed to advance the IHR by providing a path with clear targets and milestones to strengthen the core capacities and achieve IHR compliance, thereby enabling a world more safe and secure from infectious disease threats. In fact, the Ebola crisis is a prime example of the importance of being prepared and the urgent need for global health security. Since its discovery in 1976, more than 20 Ebola outbreaks have been recognized in East and Central Africa, and they were all contained relatively quickly. In December of 2013, Ebola emerged for the first time in West Africa, where it spread unnoticed for months. What was different this time? The three countries lacked the public health infrastructure to quickly detect and respond to the outbreak. There was delayed reporting and border control was spotty in an area with high population mobility, and there was a lack of infection control in healthcare facilities, including the absence of basic protective gloves, soap, and running water. By late July, Ebola had reached the urbanized and densely populated capitals of all three nations, and the first time the disease caused community-wide transmission in crowded metropolitan areas. In August, Monrovia, Liberia was experiencing the world's first urban Ebola epidemic with catastrophic results. Healthcare workers were becoming infected, medical facilities throughout the capital closed, and routine healthcare services came to a grinding halt. The medical NGO Medicine Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, MSF, was the only remaining medical NGO operating Ebola treatment units, or ETUs, in the three affected countries. We know from 40 years of experience that a critical step in stopping an Ebola epidemic is to first identify and isolate cases and their symptomatic contacts quickly, then reduce the risk of death by half through access to care in Ebola treatment units, and then ensure safe burials for persons dying from Ebola. But in Liberia, there were too few trained contact tracing teams to follow contacts of known cases. And despite MSF's intensified efforts to expand treatment capacity in Monrovia, the number of beds could not catch up with the growing need. As a consequence, contact tracing teams that did identify symptomatic contacts could not refer them to an Ebola treatment unit, leading some to return to their home village, resulting in new transmission hotspots throughout the country. There was also resistance from communities to safe burial prevention messages that conflicted with traditional burial practices. 
in Monrovia, only four out of an estimated need for 32 trained and equipped burial teams were available to remove highly infectious corpses. As a result, Ebola cases and deaths grew exponentially, resulting in more unsafe burials and new transmission chains. Calls for foreign medical teams to expand and manage ATUs went unanswered out of fear. Commercial airlines were canceling service and nations were threatening to close their borders. NGO volunteers worried that they would be stranded, that safety measures were inadequate, and that they would be denied repatriation for treatment at home if they became infected. Utter chaos erupted in Monrovia. Martial law was declared and curfews were imposed. A CDC modeling report in September estimated that there could be as many as 1.4 million Ebola cases in Liberia and Sierra Leone in just four months' time without early isolation of at least 70% of new infections. As Monrovia was sinking into chaos, another nightmare scenario was unfolding in Nigeria. An ill traveler from Liberia arrived at an international airport in Lagos, a city of 21 million people, and a regional travel hub for Africa's most populated country. If Ebola took hold in the slums of Lagos and beyond, the entire continent would be at risk. But unlike Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, Nigeria had elements of the global health security agenda in place to respond. The Nigerian CDC had, had an existing emergency operations center and incident management structure for polio eradication that was leveraged for an emergency Ebola response. Nigeria also hosts a CDC field epidemiology training program, or FETP, modeled after CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service. Within days, CDC disease detectives joined 13 Nigerian FETP trainees and 40 FETP graduates to halt the outbreak within three generations of transmission. Containing an outbreak to just 19 cases in two cities required an enormous lift from the Nigerian EOC and epidemiology team. Nigeria responded. They identified 894 contacts. They completed 19,000 contact tracing home visits to monitor symptoms and temperature. They implemented a social mobilization strategy which reached 26,000 households of people living near the contacts, and they established an ETU and trained Ebola caregivers in just two weeks' time. With just two elements of the global health security agenda in place, Nigeria was able to contain a potentially disastrous epidemic. As the tide was turning for the better in Nigeria, hope was also emerging in Liberia. In September, President Obama visited CDC, where he was fully briefed on the growing crisis. Following the briefing, President Obama announced that the US Department of Defense would deploy as many as 4,000 military personnel to provide the logistic and communication support across the region and in Liberia to build ETUs throughout the country. In addition, DOD announced that the first facility it would build and maintain would be a field hospital managed by the US Public Health Service, dedicated to the care of Liberian and expatriate healthcare workers who might become sick with Ebola. The new hospital was operational by November. This announcement was a game changer that bolstered the confidence of the larger medical NGO community, other responders, and other nations to engage in the fight, eventually putting Liberia on the road to zero. In mid-December, the US Congress also responded to the unprecedented Ebola epidemic, passing the president's emergency funding request of over $6 billion. CDC received 1.8 billion of these funds to end the Ebola epidemic, enhance Ebola preparedness in the at-risk countries, its neighbors, and the United States, and implement global health security agenda in West Africa and beyond. These emergency funds have already enabled the US government to begin work in 17 countries, including the three affected by Ebola. At least 13 more countries will be added in the coming days in line with the US government goal of implementing the agenda in at least 30 countries by 2020. Using this funding, CDC will continue to focus on getting to zero and staying at zero in the Ebola-affected countries, while also helping to build better public health systems in countries at risk for Ebola, as well as in the 30 countries where the US government has committed to partnering on global health security agenda implementation. Over the next five years, we will work in partnership with other nations to implement the agenda in the hope of averging tragedies like, strat <coughs> excuse me, tragedies like the West African Ebola epidemic from ever happening again. This is critical because outbreaks are inevitable. CDC's Global Disease Detection Center tracks outbreaks based on our assessment of the risk that they could pose to the global community. Between March 2014 and July 2015, 
In addition to Ebola, we actively monitored over 140 outbreaks of public health concern across 170 countries. Like Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus in the Middle East and South Korea, cholera in East Africa, and chikungunya virus in the Americas, several of these outbreaks have affected many lives and justify global concern. The lesson is that we cannot focus our energies on any single pathogen or any part of the world, but instead focus on what every country needs to do to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats before it becomes an epidemic. That being, invest and routinely practice global health security agenda principles to ensure a robust and resilient public health system. In summary, the global health security agenda addresses three risks, new emerging organisms, drug resistance, the intentional creation and or release of dangerous pathogens. It also provides three opportunities, strengthen the existing public health framework committed to by all nations under the IHR and develop and utilize new laboratory and surveillance tools to successfully control outbreaks. And it focuses on three priorities outlined in a prevent, detect, and respond model. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to invite Dr. Frieden back to the podium. We're a bit over time, and I'll be very quick, and so leave a few minutes for questions at the end to make five points. First, to thank our speakers for excellent, interesting, informative talks. Thank you very much. Second, to summarize some of the things we heard in 30 seconds or less, the importance of surveillance, the importance of a medical clinical surge, the, the complexity of the federal-state interaction in the U.S., the slippery slope to zero risk, understanding that we can't say zero risk, and yet that is what the public wants sometimes, and how do we manage that dynamic? Uh, the important capacities of the Department of Defense and how we can synergize with those at home and abroad. Uh, the uh, Ebola test being used in the U.S. is a DOD test for, uh, that was uh, approved by the FDA under EUA. And uh, thinking about Ebola, never forgetting that though lots went wrong and lots went right, in the end, we averted a far worse catastrophe that could have occurred if Ebola had continued to spread unchecked in West Africa or had spread in Nigeria. The world would look very different today if we were dealing with endemic Ebola in many countries in Africa. And that was definitely within the realm of possibility. So thanks, brief summary. Uh, third, global health security is the next big thing in global health. This is our unique opportunity to make rapid improvements in public health capacity around the world. Fourth, we don't know what the next outbreak or epidemic will be, but we know there will be one. We don't know from where, we don't know with what. We wouldn't have predicted H7N, H1N1 from Mexico or MERS from the Middle East, uh, but we're, what we're seeing is the inevitability of the emergence of new organisms. What's not inevitable is that they spread as rapidly and tragically as Ebola did. And fifth and finally, the real synergy between the global health security agenda and international health regulations. This is a way of accelerating adherence to the IHRs. And as President Obama noted a year ago, quote, we've got to turn those commitments into concrete action. Thank you very much. from our online audiences, uh, editing for time, what main factors compromise the earliest possible coordinated multinational response to this emergency event, and what should be done now by priority and by whom to minimize these constraints in future events? What main factors compromise the earliest possible coordinated multinational response to this emergency event, and what should be done now by priority, and by whom, to minimize these constraints in future events? Well, I, I can take a first crack at it. Um, I, I think one of the things that brought things together was, you know, taking action under the um, international health regulations and declaring a public health event, a uh, uh, public health emergency 
of international concern. I think that um, really raised the uh, ire of, of many around the world and the attention needed to have a global response. Um, CDC had activated one month before that um, event uh, with our emergency operations center, so clearly we were uh, deploying people and extremely concerned, but I think that was the, the first galvanizing effort, and perhaps we need to make sure that we lower the bar for when we declare uh, public health emergencies of, of international concern. Um, anyone else want to add to that? I would agree. I think that um, was one of the great challenges and something that we have to learn from going forward, you know, what we characterize as a PHIC, the, that's what they call it, um, versus what we don't and when we do that. Um, and I think you know, there have been a number of efforts to try to reform that process that are ongoing, and we should continue to support that. All right, we're, uh, thank, uh, thanks to our speakers uh, uh, again. Um, uh, please join us uh, next month for Public Health Grand Rounds on e-cigarettes, and um, let's have another hand for our speakers.